Hello everyone, my name is Tamiwa Ladikomo and this is The Next Wave by Tech Cabal. On the last episode, we spoke about smart cities in Africa and the possibilities and challenges of applying innovation to solve problems in Africa's urban areas. For this episode, we're talking about super apps. Super apps are mobile phone applications that offer access to a variety of options, from e-commerce to payments, ride hailing, instant messaging, food delivery, and more, all in a single app. By consolidating multiple services into a single point of entry, these apps aim to solve multiple problems for consumers and rapidly build loyalty and position for the lucky apps that succeed and delivering on their promise. It's a tricky act. Today, we'll be speaking about Africa's super apps, from now established players like Ope and Kenya's Impesa, which is now evolving from a payment platform to include features like event and bus ticketing, gift vouchers, and more, to growing players like Uganda's Safe Border. With me today, I have Emeka Ajene, who's the co-founder of Gozem, a super app that provides on-demand transportation, delivery, and cashless payment solutions in one app to hundreds and thousands of users across Francophone West Africa and Central Africa. I also have Alistair Sosok, the co-founder and co-CEO of Safe Border, a company revolutionizing transportation, payments, and on-demand services in Africa's cities. Welcome. It's great to have you on the show, Emeka. Thank you, Tamir. Great to be here. Excellent. There's a portion of Africa's startup land that is super enthusiastic about super apps. While a lot of this activity has been inspired by the success of Asian super apps like WeChat, Alipay, Gojek, and Grab, there are also a number of factors that make Africa fertile ground for super apps. In your opinion, what are the factors that made Gozem jump into the super app space and have made it so attractive to players from OPE to Safe Butter? Yeah, no, so I think um, you're absolutely right. I think increasingly um, super apps are just uh, on trend, more and more players are exploring the super app model, right? So you talk about Gozem, and for us, you know, from day one, that was always the model, right? We were very inspired by the success of Grab and Gojek in Southeast Asia, and we thought, to your point, certain characteristics of the uh, market in Africa were very conducive to having similar success on the continent, right? So in terms of those characteristics um, specifically, I think of them in, uh, in terms of uh, pulls and pushes, right? So when I say pulls, it's kind of, what, how is the market pulling a super app uh, as a solution, right? So what that means is why super apps might be attractive to African consumers, right? So there's a few reasons here. One is really a, um, you know, the average African uh, smartphone user is using a low-end smartphone. I think recent, um, recent data has shown that 85% of new shipments of smartphones were under, you know, $200. Right, and a good chunk of that is under $100, right? So you have a lot of these low-end phones with low, low specs, and particularly for our uh, purposes here, low storage, right? So in this context, a super app is uh, you know, extremely valuable, right? Instead of, you don't even have storage for, um, you know, to have a number of apps, but you could have the ut utility of thousands of apps with the storage cost of just one, right? So that's kind of one of the uh, things that the, that the market pulls a super app, app solution out. A second is kind of the uh, high cost of data, right? So if you look at stats that have come out in the past few years, um, they say on average the cost of one gigabyte of data is about 7% of the uh, monthly salary in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, compared to about 2% in the Americas, right? So in this kind of um, environment, it's, it may be preferable to download and use just one app as opposed to downloading uh, and using multiple apps, right? So there's that data factor as well. And probably thirdly, relative to the uh, consumer pull, is kind of a, uh, overall, the internet economy is young, right? So, you know, you guys, Tech about you cover the space, but, you know, it's really, I mean, over the last decade or, you know, since 2010. Um, so it's relatively young compared to, uh, to, the, to the global uh, tech space. And what this means is, I mean, we see it that Africa as a continent has the world's lowest internet penetration rate, and a lot of people are coming on for the first time. So for Super App, what it means is having the opportunity for a new internet user to learn a single interface and get comfortable with it, have unified uh, identity, unified payments, it just uh, takes away a lot of friction, right, as opposed to having to learn new interfaces constantly from different apps, right? So those are some of the, um, what we see in terms of uh, the market dynamics making Super App uh, conducive to users. 
And on the um, company side, you know, a lot of companies aren't necessarily like Gozem, who start up day one saying we're trying to build a super app. Some companies start up in different uh, verticals and then explore super apps. And why is that, right? So ultimately, the continent right now is really a mobile first and in many ways a mobile only environment, right? So it's very natural to explore innovative mobile first and mobile only uh, models, right? And super apps are a prime, prime example of that. Secondly, it's kind of a low trust environment. Right? So there's a real opportunity for anyone who builds trust, any business that builds trust, to develop, um, you know, to leverage that trust across other, other verticals. And that's what we see a, a number of new players doing. You know, thirdly, you have, um, it's kind of a, just a, again, a very new environment compared to the world. Right? So not a lot of entrenched players, right? as opposed to the U.S. and other, other developed markets. If you want to do fintech, you run some big players. If you want to do e-commerce, you run some big players. Across the continent, that's not necessarily the case, right? So that also makes it attractive for businesses. And finally, just uh, there's simple economic incentives, right? So overall, the continent is kind of a low um, average revenue per user continent. So a lot of businesses see that and look at super apps as a way to really spread that cost of customer acquisition, increase lifetime value, and also you know attack the fragmentation that the continent faces, right? If it's very hard for me to scale across the continent due to fragmentation, can I now scale across verticals? instead of scaling across regions, right? So those are some of the re reasons, um, you know, I feel folks, uh, more and more folks are looking at the super app, app model. Thanks, Emeka. That was a great introduction into this space. Now, we've seen companies evolve from providing a specific cost service into super apps. So Safe Border in Uganda, Temtem in Algeria, and Gokada in Nigeria were all ride-hailing companies. M-Pesa uh, in Kenya and MNT Halan in Egypt were primarily focused on payments and financing while MTN obviously was in the telco industry. What would you say the playbook looks like for succeeding as a super app from the trajectory of those different companies, especially as each one started from a very different sort of field and starting point? Yeah, no, so I think um, overall the playbook is, is really doesn't matter in terms of the vertical you start from to just be kind of, um, to, be very, to speak very broadly. Right, so the playbook overall is to start with a single service, even Gozem, even though, you know, as Gozem, we were from day one, as you mentioned, we were, we had the idea to build a super app. We didn't start off day one with, you know, five verticals, right? So everyone tends to start with one vertical. And the reason for that is what you're trying to do is really have a killer first service that attracts a large user base that also keeps that user base coming back frequently. Right, so those are kind of some of the keys, right? So, you know, whether that's messaging in WeChat's case, whether that's ride hailing, you know, Gozem, um, Safe Boda, and some players, what you want is to have a, a service that's attractive, high quality, attracts users, and keeps those users coming back. So, what you hear in terms of the lingo uh, is the idea of frequency, right? So, high frequency vertical. So, that just means you want users coming back several times weekly or ideally several times daily. And that gets, just gives you a lot of opportunity to cross-sell different verticals, right? So that's kind of the first uh, prong to identify and create really a high-frequency vertical. And then after that, you know, and that vertical tends to be low margin, right? So you think about ride-hailing, you know, um, you know, Uber is a good example, just low, low margin. You also think about messaging, right? It tends to be low margin. And then you can now use that um, high-frequency, low-margin business, cross-sell and layer on higher margin, lower frequency uh, items, whether that's e-commerce, food delivery, you know, these are some very high margin um, businesses, but you don't, you know, you don't necessarily order food every day, but you might, you know, take a trip, a transport trip every day. You might message your friends every day, right? So that's kind of the broad um, playbook. I think, um, you know, if you look across Africa, what I see is kind of a different, you know, maybe um, WeChat's an example, again, to go back. WeChat is a messaging first um, super app, right? Across Africa, you don't see many messaging first super apps. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because WhatsApp is so dominant, right? So everyone uses WhatsApp. It's very hard for you to come in as a new messaging player and say, you know, people should use my, uh, you know, my new messaging service, right? So w what you end up seeing is a lot of mobility first players, um, Gozem, Gokada, Safeboda, and so forth. Um, and you also see a number of financial services first super apps. You know, the Opay type uh, company, um, Palm Pay, and a few others, Jumia Pay, you could also say. 
and then a few telco first super apps, as you mentioned, right? So Vodacom, uh, M-Pesa, and a few others are building these super apps. So that's kind of the landscape you see. Um, but it's interesting. Um, there is, you know, there's a few players uh, attacking that first vertical in different ways. There's kind of um, that data-free model, um, you know, where data is a big concern. Uh, I forget why the name of the company is skipping me right now, but out of South Africa, there's a big um, data-free uh, super app uh, player there. And there's a few other players trying to get at it from a gaming first standpoint. So can I build that frequency with gaming first and then layer on other services? So that's kind of the landscape I see, but the playbook overall, high frequency service, that's low margin, layer on higher margin businesses afterwards. Thanks, Amika. So what are the challenges to making a super app work in Africa? What kind of things hinder growth or make success difficult? No, so it's a good question. I think, um, as you know, it's um, the space overall. I mean, I'll just be clear. It's still day one in terms of Africa's internet economy, right? So despite all the successes, we talk about unicorns, we talk about the growth, but it's still the earliest days, right? So while more and more people have smartphones on the ground, the reality is that having a smartphone does not make you a regular internet user, right? I'm sure you know some friends of mine as well. You have a smartphone, but there's still points in the day that people go into their smartphone and turn the data off, right? So there's this kind of idea of uh, internet affordability. You know, as mentioned before, it's very expensive to be on the internet in Africa. So that just creates a challenge for a uh, business that is online first or online only, like a super app, right? Beyond that, there's also, you know, broad issues of disposable income, right? So it's um, the idea of, you want, you know, you'll have a lot of people saying that what you want to do if you're building a business in Africa today is really build for kind of the core needs of users, food, um, transport, and so forth, right? So as you grow out a super app, you might go further and further away from core need like transport, right? So these are some of the challenges as you grow. And in addition to that, there's also kind of, you know, the broader infrastructure, Right, so not everywhere has even internet coverage for you to do uh, a super app. Right, if I live in a rural area, or sub, rural rural area of Togo, do I even have the same access to a super app that someone else might? So these are kind of some of the challenges. And um, overall, I would say also that most super apps tend to be B two C plays, right? So consumer facing plays, and I would say all. B2C plays, or the majority of them today, are kind of playing kind of a, a long-term game, right? So there's a real obstacle to 100% today, 100% app-based um, super app, or just, you know, focusing purely on digital growth, at least if you're targeting the uh, African consumer. There's a lot of examples of that, um, I think, um, and I wouldn't go into them, but there's a lot of examples of that. So I think all these B2C players have to look beyond the app, at least right now, to generate revenue. And for us, for Gozem and a few players, um, you know, a good example is kind of uh, look into asset vehicle financing, right? So while Gozem has, you know, transport, while we have e-commerce, while we have, you know, food delivery, you know, a big, you know, an increasingly important part of the business is actually offline financing of vehicles to drivers, right? So as we are ready to ride the wave of consumers, you know, going, uh, coming online and being more digitally savvy, we also recognize that today it's important to also um, have some exposure to an offline, um, really B2B uh, service like vehicle financing for our drivers. So it's just something um, I think that, you know, a lot of players, B2B, whether you're a super app or not, that you have to really consider that, you know, it's still day one in Africa. So how are you going to gather that, you know, scale in terms of GMV revenue or what have you? Gotcha. Thank you. So. The Asian super apps got into the space well ahead of Africa. What is your sense of what African super apps can learn from their Asian counterparts, particularly when it comes to hacking growth and expansion? Yes, so it's a very interesting question, right? So I've said in the past myself, right, um, that you know, African entrepreneurs, African startups should look to Asia um, as a model instead of the US, right? The market's just more comparable to, um, to African markets than Western markets. Right. But that being said, you know, it's um, it's while it's important to look to these markets above all for business model inspiration and, you know, to get a sense of how you can succeed where Internet's not perfect, where you have, you know, other characteristics. Um, it's the market isn't completely analogous. Right. So, for example, we talk about WeChat a lot in this um, you know, discussion about uh, super apps, but it really doesn't make sense to WeChat, obviously, Chinese company. 
but really doesn't make sense to compare, for example, China to Africa, right? So China is one um, homogenous market, one large homogenous market. Africa, you have a lot of regulatory fragmentation. So much, you know, it's uh, exponentially difficult to penetrate the African continent than to penetrate China, right? So there's real, um, you have to be sensitive on, you know, your learnings and takeaways from looking at Asia. Um, but kind of, again, you know, if you look at the Gozum example, we're really inspired from um, Grab and uh, Gojek, Indonesia, uh, Singapore as well. While these markets are different, there's, you know, certain things you could take uh, diving more deeply into the story, right? I think your question is a bit more about expansion and um, hacking growth. So, I mean, what you learn is how do you, you know, satisfy um, users? How do you satisfy drivers? What incentives come to play um, relative to growth? On the expansion side, it's just, you know, learning from these companies in terms of their, um, their sequence of uh, expansion, right? And trying to take away insights that might not be um, readily apparent. Right. So, for example, I mean, um, WeChat, again, we started with uh, messaging in 2011. They went to um, social payments and games uh, and games right, in 2013. And then after that, they had the uh, partnership with Didi in uh, 2014 and started Commerce the same year. And then finally, 2017 was the launch of mini apps. Right. So this is uh, and they, WeChat itself launched in 2010. Right. So you have a seven year span from launch until, you know, the ultimate mini apps that everyone considered the, you know, holy grail of a super app today. But even beyond that, you have from 2010 until 2013. So three years of just one vertical, really, just messaging before they layer on uh, payments, before they layer on um, uh, ride hailing, right? So it's, um, I mean, so you could, there's different things you could take away. But one of the takeaways for us is that it's really right to get that first service right. Right, and it's not just. It doesn't make sense just to rush it in the name of having a super app. What you really want again is that you know core user base having that high frequency before layering on other things. So that's kind of what I would say is you know looking at some of going beyond the headlines, looking at some of the stories and the operational um, how these companies actually operated in the early days and trying to take away insights from that. Emeka, thank you so very much. This has been a really great introduction into super apps. We're going to go on a quick commercial break now, and when we come back, we're going to have Alistair talking a bit more about how super apps are changing Africa's economic landscape. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back, everyone. With us, we have Alistair Susak, who is the co-founder of SafeBudder. Hi, Alistair, how are you? Hey, guys. Yeah, good to be here. Fantastic. So a frequent origin for super apps is that they evolve from a single focused product into something more expansive over time. Can you tell us a bit about SafeBudder's evolution as a product? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, from, from, from small beginnings in the end of 2014, right? So a while back now, um, SafeBudder started as a community of motorcycle taxi drivers, right? And in, in Uganda, they're known as Boda Boda. Um, and basically, it was myself, uh, Ricky, and Max. And, and Ricky, we were the co-founders. And Ricky was a, a boater driver. Um, and we had this vision of kind of building a community of drivers that were seen to be safer, more trusted. They would have these big orange helmets um, with a reflector jacket with their personal name on the back, right? So in Kampala, every day, you know, there's 1.5 million rides. There's Boda Boda everywhere on every street corner. Um, people use them, but they're incredibly unsafe and not trusted. So this community of drivers that we're building would be very different to that. So that's where it all started. You know, it, it wasn't a tech play. Uh, it was very much a community play. It was like working with these drivers, doing training, and showing that they were different, right? Then we, of course, realized that there was a way to build, you know, a, an app system, you know, this was 2014. So, you know, Uber was growing around the world. There was understanding that, you know, there was this kind of ride hailing was emerging. And so we built, you know, a basic version of that with a cashless payment in it, right? So the cashless payment was a way to kind of seamlessly go from A to B and not worry about change, right? Um, that was, you know, a small percentage of our overall rides. You know, it wasn't half of our rides, it was less, but it was something that was quite innovative and enabled us to you know, be able to offer something of value in the market as well. So yes, yeah, so we built the trust, we think with customers. And then of course, we kind of realized maybe there's a bunch of other stuff that we can provide our, our drivers and our customers, right? What else can we 
provide on our on our app, which of course became a platform. You know, what what else can you provide on that platform? And so then over time, we kind of looked at other things that, that were possible that we could build, right? So kind of parcel delivery, uh, food delivery, um, and then kind of payments, right? So we had this wallet from kind of from day one, closed loop wallet. Um, you know, what else could we provide? What bill bill payment use cases could we do? Could people send safe boda cashless to each other? You know, so we looked at all of that stuff and we, and we built many of those things. And then, you know, recently now we've got cars uh, as well on the app as another transportation key use case. So definitely evolving from the single use case to multiple use cases. Um, so, you know, we, we've completed over 45 million rides as a business, you know, and a reasonable monthly active user base. Um, and the core transport use case, though, is still the important one. So there's lots of interesting learnings about, you know, the challenges as well of, of building a super app, which can claim to do many things. I love the origin and community. I also love your a reasonable user base. <laughs> it's an interesting way to phrase it. What are the trends that you're most optimistic about? You know, what are the things that you've seen in market that make you feel like, look, there is a long term sort of future in this, like there is a big business still to be built yeah, in this I mean, space? Yeah, I, th I think it's the, again, maybe it's the cliche answers around users, you know, the number of people getting smartphones, the number of people getting online, penetration of services is still very low, which means there's lots of potential for it to grow. Data costs are coming down, you know, for people to get online. That is happening. Whether it's happening fast enough to satisfy many company entrepreneurs right now, day to day, you know, we, they feel the, the constraints of that. I think you know that's that's a challenge, but but definitely we are moving in the right. That big macro trend of people getting online is happening. The the the, the rural to urban you know migration that's happening across so many countries. That's that's something which is only going to benefit particularly you know tech companies. Um, I think another big trend though is that companies with large solid core businesses will do very well in the next few years, right? So telcos, telcoms, you know, that have large amount of users that are using the rails of the SIM card or of mobile money, you know, they're going to be in a good position, right? So if you look at Safaricom and PESA, you know, they're just expanding, expanding their reach, uh, their depth. Um, and so, you know, and I think, you know, the cost of capital has gone up. And so acquisition of customers is going to be very hard in the next year or two. Uh, or it's just not going to be easy to go very fast, right? So we definitely saw in 2018, 2019, a wave of, of companies, you know, really acquiring lots of users. I mean, Opay would be an example in Nigeria, you know, kind of big bang, super app approach, build a bunch of stuff, and then quickly cut the stuff that wasn't working or they felt wasn't working, you know? So I think as a trend, we're not going to see as much of that kind of a very aggressive expansion. It's going to be more the well-established players that have already existing customer bases that they're monetizing, you know. Uh, and then on the B2B side, I mean, you know, that's going to be a bit easier because, you know, those acquisition costs are not going to be as high. And the question is, is like the depth that they're going as well. I think payment companies we're seeing across, across you know, payment company super apps, you know, are, are, are promising. It's just the question is, is how, how well they can... Um, yeah, I really can keep going now with the cost of capital being higher. Fantastic. Now, that's useful perspective. Thank you for sharing. Are there big regulatory concerns you have, especially operating across markets? Generally, there's not any huge concerns. Uh, you know, we are obviously in a very informal sector, you know, uh, with, with two wheelers, with motorcycle taxis, Okada, Boda. Um, cars is more regulated. Uh, we follow, you know, the regulation in, in wherever they exist in both markets, right? You know, in Uganda, passengers are by law supposed to wear helmets, right? Our drivers carry a spare helmet, um, but most drivers don't wear helmets, and you'll see police officers driving with, with no helmet on, right? So it, some of these markets, that there's regulation, but whether regulation is enforced is, is kind of the, the question. Um, so, you know, we, we want to work with government as best as we can and to help regulate, make the industry safer. We know we're well positioned to do that because we are, you know, trying to help our drivers follow all the rules and, you know, help them show, you know, to customers, importantly, that they are, um, you know, they're trusted and safe and, and they have all the protections they need, right? 
Um, so yeah, no, I think we've been a, a good kind of, like let's say, showing the economic returns to being safe and to following regulation, right? So drivers that wear helmets make more money because they're safe boda, right? And so drivers are then incentivized to ultimately follow the rules. So it's kind of been a, a way to like silently regulate the industry without using, you know, you know, kind of, if you have a carrot and stick method, using a carrot method, which is, hey, wear a helmet, wear a reflective jacket, have a, have a, a helmet for your passenger, reduce, you know, road accidents, which is a huge killer and a huge GDP, you know, negative effect on, on, on every market we're in. It really hurts the economy. You know, do all this and then you get there. Yeah. That was really, really fascinating, useful to hear. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Alistair. I'm going to have to bring today's conversation to a close, um, but thank you for joining us and we appreciate your perspectives. For the audience, I hope today's conversation has been a useful introduction to super apps and the issues across the, around them across the continent. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to thank everyone who's been watching. Join us next week when we talk about building the African metaverse. As always, you can tweet at us using the hashtag TheNextWaveCNBC. You can also send in your feedback via thenextwave at techcabal.com. Thanks again and see you soon.